So let us start with answering the question. So there is one question uh, about uh, substrate channeling. So, so substrate channeling is when you have um, multiple enzymes as a single complex. What I mean by this is, uh, you know, the multiple enzymes, let us say multiple polypeptides, when they are all uh, bound together into a single complex through covalent or non-covalent interactions when they are present as a single complex. And when you have a particular reaction going on in the active site and if the product of that uh, reaction becomes a substrate for another active site and if this product without diffusing into the medium you know whether it is mitochondrial matrix or cytoplasm without diffusing into the surrounding medium on the enzyme surface itself when it directly passes to the next active site okay that is what is substrate channeling so in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex that we discussed so you have the first reaction where you have the pyruvate dehydrogenase the, the product of that is the acetaldehyde carried on the thymine pyrophosphate okay in the hydroxyethyl format and the two electrons abstracted from the substrate so these do not get diffused into the medium and then the next enzyme takes up from the medium that that is in this case mitochondrial matrix so instead directly on the enzyme surface itself from the pyruvate dehydrogenase active site it moves on to the dihydrolipoyl transacetylase active site where the acetaldehyde uh, acetyl group by the time it is oxidized to carboxylic acid and it is in thioester form, uh, uh, form and that linkage is transferred to coenzyme A. Now this coenzyme A diffuses into the medium but the two electrons taken there which is in the you know red sulfhydryl form the reduced lipoic acid moiety directly goes to the next enzyme okay which is the dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase. So this sort of product from one active site directly on the enzyme surface itself moving on to the next active site. This is what we call a substrate channeling. So the advantage of this is the effective concentration is very high because once it gets into the uh, medium then it uh, depends on the, its diffusion rate and the actual concentration in the medium all of that matters while on the enzyme surface it is nearly like an intramolecular reaction because the enzyme itself is a molecule so that is one the effective concentration is very high and therefore catalysis happens very readily and second once it is in medium then each enzyme competes um for the substrates present in the medium so if uh, in, in that particular example if the acetyl group is also used by another enzyme that enzyme also will take this acetyl group so so that is another reason so these are the reasons why why substrate channeling has evolved and that is favored for these kind of reactions all right so let us continue with our um journey of the electrons from glucose all the way to oxygen so we have now completed our path through glycolysis pyruvate dehydrogenase complex so by the time we have come into mitochondria from cytoplasm and now we are going through the tca cycle okay so now the electrons are at the end of the tca cycle they are all now in the form of nadh or fadh2 okay so right in front of us is the uh, yeah, dehydrogenase reaction where it is the FAD that is the cofactor. And I want to constantly remind you these coenzymes are vitamins. Okay, so that directly connects you to everyday life. You know, it connects you to the food that you ate this morning or the lunch you are going to eat. So th th these are all like completely unlike many other topics you learn. These are directly connected to your very existence and your very activities. Okay. So it's, it's one of the pillars of biology. So take the time and effort required to learn biochemistry thoroughly. 
the only other course which is parallel in this importance is genetics and then of course to some extent cell biology so these three courses the foundational concepts must be thorough in you for the rest of your life okay so so make sure to have a good textbook on all three of these subjects biochemistry genetics and cell biology read them thoroughly regardless of to what extent they are covered in the syllabus for the exam or not okay that is uh, that is important you need to have good grades that uh, i am not uh, belittling it but at the same time when you graduate with your um, degree in biotechnology and if these concepts are not clear that will be worse than uh, you know not having gotten a good grade so make sure you do that regularly so so this is a uh, flavin nucleotide okay so this is the one that is getting uh, reduced here uh, by oxidizing succinate to fumarate and this enzyme interestingly is a membrane bound enzyme other enzymes in the tca cycle they are all in the mitochondrial matrix so mitochondrial matrix what is mitochondrial matrix i am not sure whether you have already had cell biology and how much cell biology you remember but for this topic that is very very important we will see a good picture somewhere but for now i will draw a, a small cartoon so so let's me take this one and try here so mitochondria is kind of an oval shaped structure okay once upon a time it was a bacteria freely living and it entered into a eukaryotic cell and then set up a symbiotic relationship with eukaryote so this is the outer membrane okay so this is the outer membrane and then you have an inner membrane which is folded like this okay i'm not going to draw for the rest of fate um in the interest of time but you understand the inner one is folded so the surface area is increased and this is the inner membrane on that membrane is where all the oxidative phosphorylation we are going to learn are uh, present the electron transfer complexes are present and this phase inner phase is what is matrix okay so the author of this book uh, leninger uh, and uh, another scientist uh, by name eugene kennedy these two are the ones who discovered tca cycle oxidative phosphorylation they all happen um in um, my in mitochondria okay so so this is matrix and this is where uh, tca cycle is happening so this succinate dehydrogenase enzyme is actually attached to the inner membrane um so the importance of that will become clear when we go to the oxidative phosphorylation where we will look at the electron transport chain so so this is the one that oxidizes um succinate by a dehydrogenation reaction so two hydrogen and two electron are transferred so here the electron transfer is in the form of hydrogen atoms and that fumarate by the action of fumarase becomes malate essentially this double bond gets hydrated meaning a water molecule is added hydroxyl ion and then the proton here and uh, this enzyme is very peculiar you know it's highly stereo specific um it catalyzes the hydration only of the trans double bond see the moment you have a double bond we have this cis trans or geometric isomerism that we learned a long time ago so that comes into picture so only when it is in trans this enzyme will abstract uh, accept it as a substrate it will not take the maleate as a substrate so this is the cis isomer of fumarate and this is not a substrate for this fumarase enzyme okay and similarly in the reverse reaction it will not take the d maleate and it is only the l maleate so so this is the hydration reaction by fumarase to produce malate see we are almost there see this is seven of eight steps 
and the next is a dehydrogenation of this malate forming oxaloacetate where we started so malate dehydrogenase uses nad the oxidized form you know shown by this plus sign this is not the overall charge on nad it is the sign that that particular nitrogen atom is in the oxidized form so that is reduced and you have the oxaloacetate essentially this is a uh, removal of uh, two hydrogens and uh, it, the, here the mode of transfer is hydride ion two electrons and one proton that is into the NADH and the other proton goes into the medium so this is how we get the oxaloacetate back so this table summarizes starting from glucose till completing one cycle of oxaloacetate okay in the process what, what have we done we have done uh, removal of three carbon dioxides meaning three carbons are lost when when the pyruvate became acetyl coa the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme acted as a decarboxylase and removed carbon dioxide then second when isocitrate became alpha ketoglutarate then alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase reaction ending in succinyl coa so essentially half of glucose has been converted into carbon dioxide by the whole step glycolysis pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and then tca cycle if you take tca cycle alone acetyl group acetyl coa entered meaning two carbon atoms ch3 co um, entered and both of them are uh, gone out in this form of carbon dioxide and these are not directly from the acetyl coa that enters eventually overall it balances two carbons entered and two carbons left so that is the count of carbon atoms here and uh, we see that it is oxidized to the it's a highest oxidized state then in terms of the energy currency we need to calculate so glucose to glucose 6 phosphate 1 atp we spent to energize in the preparative phase of glycolysis then fructose 6 phosphate to fructose 1 6 phosphate another preparative step one more atp so two negatives and then we made uh, two nadh in the glycerol date so once it is triose the number it increases to two to indicate we are talking with reference to glucose okay from one glucose you get two glycerol a3 phosphate so when this is cleaved it is cleaved into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glycerol a3 phosphate then the isomerase converts it to the other dhap into glycerol a3 phosphate so it is two and here we produce two nadh and that could be equivalent to three or five electron depending on uh, where the electron transfer happens then uh, in this step uh, 2 ATP, then phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate 2 ATP. The two substrate level phosphorylations um, we saw in glycolysis. Okay, At that time I told you substrate level phosphorylation is from substrate, the high energy bond uh, cleavage is used to making uh, ATP, and the phosphate group is transferred from the substrate to the ADP this is in contrast to what you will see in oxidative phosphorylation where the proton gradient leads to the synthesis of atp and there the phosphate comes from the medium in the form of inorganic phosphate so that is oxidative phosphorylation this is substrate level phosphorylation so then pyruvate dehydrogenase complex produced two nadh um that is one per pyruvate and then this uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase, then alpha ketoglutarate, then this uh, high energy diester bond of succinyl CoA, uh, its hydrolysis 2 ATP, then succinate to fumarate, succinate dehydrogenase, the one that we just saw the first reaction today, the sixth step, 2 FADH2, and that equals 3, then malate dehydrogenase, again 2 NADH. Converting all these uh, electron carrier uh, loaded electrons in terms of ATP equivalent, the total comes somewhere between 30 to 32. Okay, 
So this is the total amount of ATP available when glucose is completely oxidized to carbon dioxide. And the electrons abstracted are used to reduce oxygen into water molecules. So this is the balance sheet as of now. All right. So now, uh, remember yesterday I told you nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So we are going to look at that CTC cycle from this point. So I just summarized the big thing that has happened in TCA cycle is acetyl group got oxidized into two carbon dioxides. Big deal, right? It's just burn it away and it goes carbon dioxide. Why all these complex uh, enzymatic reactions, you know, decarboxylations, dehydrogenations, and different kind of molecules producing? Why is all this complexity just to oxidize acetyl CoA to carbon dioxide? So that is the kind of question you will ask if you are an engineer designing the perfect energy efficient machine. Okay. Biology is not a machine. Living organisms, although their functions may have analogies to um, man-made machines, but they never meant to be machines. They are simply progression. Each one of the living organisms is an intermediate step in the progression of rearrangements of matter that is made possible by the sun's energy as permitted by the laws of physics and chemistry. Okay. So there is nobody here designing a perfect energy efficient machine. There is nobody designing uh, the shortest route to convert acetyl CoA to carbon dioxide. So here what is actually happening is whatever is possible keeps happening in that particular environmental context and whatever process in that context helps that organism to survive to the level it can reproduce okay here success in biology means reproductive success no organism right now exists whose ancestors were reproductively unsuccessful just think you know in the in an entire lineage um of any organism or yourself or another human being you think of, can it or could it have had a reproductively unsuccessful ancestor? It is impossible. So when we think of successful organism, the fittest to the environment, we are thinking about in terms of reproductive success. Did that organism manage to grow and survive to reach the age of uh, reproduction and did it successfully reproduce because only when it reproduces its genetics go genes or genetic inheritance is passed on to the next generation and it kind of it perpetuates in the absence every organism is a dead end of the evolution so it is only based on that sort of uh, context we understand why this complex pathway to convert acetyl CoA to carbon dioxide. It is probably, you know, why these steps may have been happening one step or two or three steps in an ancestral organism for a different purpose. And it, the pathway could have been linear. And eventually, as oxygen accumulated through the action of the photosynthetic organisms like cyanobacteria, which was the first photosynthetic organism, then organisms learn to live with the presence of oxygen. They learn to use oxygen uh, for producing energy. And that is how this pathway would have been put together. So this is one. So this pathway or this way of converting acetyl CoA to carbon dioxide provide, uh, provided the advantage for survival in during the course of evolution. So that is how you need to understand this. And second, the purpose of this pathway is not simply energy abstraction from burning a fuel. It is also producing 
precursors for many other um, biosynthesis of many other molecules that is what this slide focuses on okay the role of citric acid cycle in anabolism for example if you take um, let us take uh, pyruvate itself so the pyruvate uh, simply by transamination becomes alanine okay so if, if, uh, just i'll show you that transamination we will uh, learn at the very end um, of this course so so if you take pyruvate uh, the way we have been seeing the diagram the same way i'll draw okay so now at transamination um we are going to do here so remove that and then you are going to have an nh2 and uh, here again h so that is the transamination reaction the end product of it so now what is this this is um, alanine okay so this is an amino acid you have a carboxylic acid group an amino group this is the alpha carbon then your methyl group is the side chain that is alanine so through transamination you convert pyruvate into alanine and by a very similar logic uh, oxaloacetate here can become aspartate and by the if an amide bond forms and i ammonia group is uh, attached then it becomes asparagine and these go into making pyrimidines which are the nitrogenous basis of um, you know cereal uh, uh, thymine and um, cytosine uracil of our nucleic acids okay similarly you make serine glycine cysteine phenylalanine tyrosine tryptophan all of that from these intermediates and um, citrate goes into fatty acids and sterol biosynthesis alpha ketoglutarate another transamination like oxaloacetate forming aspartate this transamination forms glutamate and glutamate is precursor for purines you know adenine and guanine and from glutamate you make these amino acids as well and the succinate is important for porphyrin which is the you know which is uh, porphyrin rings attached is what is heme and heme is the prosthetic group in cytochromes and hemoglobin where it carries oxygen okay so like that the intermediates of tca cycle are precursors for the biosynthesis of many important molecules okay so so these the so this is another uh, reason why you want to go through this complex pathway of oxidizing acetyl coa so this is the role of citric acid cycle in anabolism okay so this red arrows uh, we are going to look at it um, in another probably in the very next slide so the so all of this is happening in the mitochondrial matrix and glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm so each one of this or these molecules the intermediates are in a constant flux so the, the as uh, we just discussed this alpha ketoglutarate glutarate if glutamate is required and if this is getting siphoned off from the tca cycle then this needs to be produced okay so each one is connected to other pathways as well so due to that there is a constant flux through these networked biochemical reactions and therefore the enzyme activities are very tightly regulated to ensure the required concentrations of each of these intermediates to ensure efficient operation of tca cycle as long as acetyl coa is available like for example you don't want to be in short supply of uh, uh, oxaloacetate when you have a lot of acetyl coa that needs to be oxidized so therefore oxaloacetate must be produced uh, by some other means and that kind of replenishing 
the TCA cycle intermediates is what is called anaplerosis or anaplerotic reactions. Um, that is uh, here. Okay, anaplerotic reactions. The noun is anaplerosis. And um, this is uh, highlighted here. For example, pyruvate by the action of pyruvate carboxylase. Don't confuse with the pyruvate decarboxylase, which removes carboxyl group from pyruvate. Instead, here you add another carboxyl group to pyruvate to make oxaloacetate. So that is one way of replenishing oxaloacetate concentration. This is one of the primary anaplerotic reactions. Okay, so the, the only the primary ones are marked here. Among them, this is the most common one. So you can have pyruvate coming from multiple sources, the main one being glucose uh, via glycolysis. Another one, transamination of alanine gives you pyruvate in the reverse reaction as what I drew here. And you get oxaloacetate. And similarly, oxaloacetate can be made from phosphoenol pyruvate as well by the action of pep carboxykinase or pep carboxylase. And another uh, intermediate that is replenished is malate. Again, the source is pyruvate. So primarily, anaplerotic reactions rely on PEP and pyruvate to produce either oxaloacetate or malate. So, which one is the main one depends on the tissue. So, in the liver and kidney, this is the dominant one. And this is an example of an important uh, theme in biochemical reactions. So, therefore, we are going to look at this pyruvate carboxylase reaction in some depth. To the same level, we saw how thiamine pyrophosphate functions in pyruvate decarboxylase to produce acetaldehyde in ethanol fermentation. So similarly, we will look at this as well. So there we learned one vitamin, which is thiamine. Now we will learn another B complex vitamin, biotin. Okay. So this biotin dependent one carbon transfer is a common theme or concept in biochemistry. And this is a good example. And therefore we are going to uh, learn about this enzyme. So, so these are the four uh, our main anaplerotic reactions. Um, this is taken from the medium. You know, this is carbonic acid, which is the primary buffer in our blood. And that uh, provides the carbon dioxide. Um, and that needs energizing. It makes a carboxy phosphate by hydrolyzing ATP. So we will see that in detail now. And that is one. So that's primarily in liver and kidney. And uh, from PIP, uh, this carboxy kinase, this is kinase because of this GDP to GTP conversion. And that is in heart and skeletal muscle. Then phosphoenol pyruvate by another route, like similar to this uh, with um, carbonic acid, you have carboxylase making oxaloacetate that is in these tissues, uh, like plants, yeast and bacteria. Then a different way of converting pyruvate, that is malic enzyme to malate. Um, so there, there is a dehydrogenation involved and um, so that is in widely in all organisms. Okay, so we are not going to look at all the four of them. Um, so our focus is for one main concept, take one well-known uh, reaction and learn about it. So that is how an introductory, introductory group uh, class can be balanced. It is not totally superficial. We get enough depth. Uh, depth but only to the extent we can handle in a 40 hour class so so we, we are not going to gloss over all the things and instead we are going to learn a few things and some examples in some good detail so in that sense we are going to focus on pyruvate carboxylase alone and this is a highly regulated enzyme it's virtually inactive if you don't have acetyl coa okay so if you don't have acetyl coa what's the point of making oxaloacetate because acetyl coa oxaloacetate only can combine to start the citric acid cycle. So, so it is activated allosterically when you have acetyl coa available. So that enough oxaloacetate is produced and the cycle can start. So, how does this enzyme carboxylate pyruvate? 
So biotin is the coenzyme here. So this is a prosthetic group. It is like lipoic acid. This is attached to lysine NH2 group. Okay, so the remember lysine has a long side chain with an epsilon amino group and there in amide linkage this is attached. So like lipoic acid this also carries a, a carboxyl group and that is in amide linkage here. And this again has a long chain. Only thing is it has a ring like structure. And the main um, atom in it like the carbon ion carbon that, uh, you know, carbon 2, which is weakly acidic in thiamine pyrophosphate or the thiol group sulfur in um, pantothenic acid containing coenzyme A, like that here it is the, this um, nitrogen, which is the main atom that is going to participate in the reaction. So this is the biotin. Um, and this again has a long arm, just like what we saw with the coenzyme A or uh, pri primarily uh, that the long arm's usefulness we learnt in the context of lipoic acid, right? Lipoic acid, how it can swing from the active site of phosphor pyruvate dehydrogenase all the way to the dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, the third enzyme of that PDH complex. So similar thing this also does, this long arm. Um, so here first the bicarbonate, uh, you know, is uh, th this is hydroxyl group attached to the carboxyl group that is bicarbonate and that uh, donates the carbon dioxide essentially in the form of carboxyphosphate. So that is the active or reactive form of carbon dioxide. So, so that happens in one active site of the pyruvate carboxylase and uh, ADP, you know, ATP is hydrolyzed and the phosphoric acid is attached to this um, you know, uh, carbon, this car carboxyl group carbon here. Carboxyphosphate is the intermediate. So then uh, the ph phosphate is removed and you this generates the free carbon dioxide at the active site. So this is not freely diffusing away. And um, this um, nucleophile, you know, this is an extra pair of electrons and that reacts with this um, carbon, which is, uh, you know, electron deficient because of these two oxygen atoms. And now you have the carboxy biotin. So this is a biotin carries carbon dioxide. And since it's a one carbon, we call this as one carbon transfer. Okay. So this one carbon transfer is an important uh, class of reactions, um, group transfers that happen in biochemistry. So we saw acyl group transfer example, phosphoryl group, we saw so many of them. And this is a one carbon carrying um, step. And so temporarily, this one carbon in the form of carbon dioxide is carried by this carboxy biotin. Now it swings and takes this to this active site in the next step. And um, so we saw this step one, uh, which is uh, actually activating the carbon dioxide. Um, so we have that in step two. This is the carboxyphosphate formation, step one, and then the carbon dioxide. So it is essentially dehydrated. Okay, so it loses the H2O from it. And um, then it is in the third step, it is attached to the biotin. Then in the fourth step, the biotin um, you know, swings to the other side, and in the other side, you have the uh, carbon dioxide uh, in, in the other catalytic site, okay. So now in that site, the pyruvate uh, is converted into its enol form the, by abstracting a proton here by this nitrogen. So this ring abstract this and converts C double bonds and this will be a hydroxyl group. So the proton essentially goes here. 
um, sorry, the electron goes here, proton is subtracted by this. And the enol form is stabilized. Remember, pyruvate can exist in uh, keto enol tautomerism, and that is why pyruvate is more stable than the phosphoenol pyruvate, and that is why pepto pyruvate is uh, it proceeds with the large uh, negative delta G. Okay, so and in that enol form, that carbon interacts with the carbon dioxide. Okay, so this is the enol form here. So this is the same thing for continuity. I have put the same image once more here. So these electron flows results in the enol form and that enol form, uh, e that enol is what interacts with the carbon dioxide. And that gets attached and you have the oxaloacetate. Okay, so remember this is aspartic acid side chain. This double bond O, if through transamination becomes CHNH2, this is aspartic acid. So, so you get the oxaloacetate and the enzyme is back. So this is the role of biotin uh, in carrying one carbon from one active site to another active site. So this is the pyruvate carboxylase reaction mechanism. And uh, this is sort of summarizing these uh, long armed molecules that we have encountered. So, so far, let us count how many vitamins we have encountered. We saw niacin, flavin, then thiamine, then uh, pantothenic acid as part of coenzyme A. And now we have got biotin. So, five vitamins we have learned. So along with biochemistry, you are also learning biochemistry of nutrition here. So among these molecules, what is our focus here is this long arm, how that helps. So this we saw very clearly the, how this swings uh, among three active sites, this lipoic acid. And uh, this one, biotin, we just saw. So, so this is the biotin spot, this is the lysine. So this is lipoyl lysine, this is biotinyl lysine. Then pantothenic acid, along with this mercaptoethyl, I mean adding a you know, couple of more uh, carbon and this nitrogen and extending this chain. So these molecules, uh, so this we will encounter in its this tethering role in uh, fatty acid biosynthesis. Okay. Uh, so these molecules, all of them, with the, due to the presence of this long arm, they tether, tether meaning attaching, you know, connecting um, a molecule to another um, bigger molecule, help in substrate channeling, taking group from one active site to another active site. That is substrate channeling. You just saw an example of substrate channeling here. You know, this is substrate channeling from one active site to another active site. So, so this, this is the you know, highlight on the biological tethers because we have seen uh, these vitamins just uh, recently. And the last topic um, for today is um, regulation of citric acid cycle. It's, it's quite simple uh, concept. Essentially what is happening is the important enzymes that proceed with large negative delta G, they are subject to regulation by the products of the pathway, not necessarily by the immediate product of that enzyme. Okay. So immediate product of pyruvate dehydrogenase will be, um, you know, like acetyl-CoA is an immediate one, NADH is an immediate one, but ATP is not, fatty acids are not. And, um, so, for example, when you have a lot of fatty acids, you don't need to uh, convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. These fatty acids through their own catabolism will generate acetyl-CoA. So, the overall uh, end product uh, is what ultimately ends up negatively regulating these enzymes, the key enzymes. In this case, this is like a committed step. Um, 
and this is also rate limiting step the this is the slowest the first decarboxylation step the pyruvate dehydrogenase step is the slowest and though uh, such an enzyme is subject to feedback inhibition allosteric inhibition by the end products and they are also positively regulated allosterically by the substrates like amp you know you have lot of amp and less atp means and you need to make atp then this enzyme is activated and so on so this is one and second the first step of a tca cycle that oxaloacetate acetyl coa producing citrate citrate synthase again is similarly allosterically regulated by the pathways end products okay so here there is no nadh involved but when you have lot of nadh you know all the nad are um, in the reduced form why operate tca cycle because the tca cycles the main thing is producing this orange color here the electron carriers carrying electrons that is in the reduced form and if they are already plenty you don't need to operate this cycle and uh, therefore the early steps you know are stopped so this is the second such important enzyme and in addition to these two which are the principal enzymes regulated in tca cycle operation these two are also subject to uh, regulation so isocitrate uh, dehydrogenase as well as alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase so again remember this enzyme is very very similar to this only the first step the pdh dehydrogenase has substrate specificity for pyruvate while alpha keto glutarate complexes first enzyme that is this dehydrogenase is substrate specific for alpha keto glutarate the transacetylase in under the next uh, transacetylase of these two and then the dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase the third enzyme they are identical in these two complexes so the so the and similar complex works in um, branch chain amino acid oxidation as well and these are thought to have evolved from common precursors okay evolutionarily they come from a common um, ancestor so this is again subject to regulation by the products so these are the four steps where you have allosteric uh, positive activation by the substrates of the pathway not that enzyme step itself and negatively regulated by the products sometimes the immediate product or substrate and sometimes the overall product or substrate of the pathway so this is the main uh, regulatory mechanism we need to remember in addition there are hormones that regulate the gene expression like genes that encode these enzymes they are subject to regulation at that level as well okay so uh, we do i have any okay then we move to oxidative phosphorylation let's uh, begin that in a new class like next monday what does this uh, cross and green mark in this yeah the cross meaning negative regulation and the green triangle meaning positive regulation so these molecules activate this enzyme allosterically meaning positive effectors and these molecules or negative effectors meaning they are allosteric inhibitors of this enzyme okay what is the meaning of anaperosis it's basically anabolic replenishing okay so that is what is uh, anaperosis anaperosis is uh, producing from other sources these intermediate molecules here you know primarily oxaloacetate and malate from pyruvate or phosphoenol pyruvate so that is anaperosis that is replenishing the intermediates of the citric acid cycle from other sources so here are the main ones listed okay